Hey, everybody. It's uh, Todd Conklin in the Pre-Accident Podcast. How are you today? It is good to talk to you. Oh, my goodness, isn't it? So a couple weeks ago, I spoke at a conference. Actually, we did a podcast on the conference called the Alert Conference, which is uh, uh, kind of this national conference for first responders, kind of. But I spoke in the physician's track, so there were a lot of people there, ambulance guys and fire chiefs and and um, uh, emergency room physicians and dispatchers, all those kind of people. And, you know, they live in an adaptive world. Um, planning isn't even, I mean, it's not even kind of a, it's, 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 they can't, I mean, they can plan all they want to, but they, their job is unexpected events. And um, I gave an introduction on HRO because the medical communities really interested in high reliability. It's a, it's a huge kind of a gigantic thing for them. It's big, big, big deal. And so I gave kind of an overview of this safety differently stuff. And I got to follow a a really interesting speaker, uh, Dr. Gary Weinstein. Um, I don't know if you know him or not. If you do, you're lucky because he's hilarious and he's funny. Uh, Just an incredibly interesting guy. And he was the, I, I think I'm going to have to make his title up because I didn't get a business card because we talked so much, but I forgot to. But he was, uh, he's like the director of kind of the emergency medicine part of um, a major hospital in Dallas. And I, do you, if you've been listening to the podcast, you probably remember when Dallas got the Ebola patient. And we we talked about it on this podcast because I talked about the fact that that you can plan for everything and you make reasonable risk-based assumptions based upon, you know, where you think the risk is greatest. And my guess was, and I don't know if anybody else thought of this, but my guess was is that the first public ER in the United States to have an Ebola patient was not Dallas. I mean, I would think that they probably thought, no, it's not us. It's going to be maybe Atlanta for sure or Chicago or Houston. Houston would be a big hit. L.A., San Francisco, New York, any of these places with major ports of entry and lots of population, they seem to be perfect for this kind of problem. But, you know, it didn't happen there. It happened in Dallas, Texas, in Presbyterian Hospital. And it happened in such a way that a patient came off the street and into the emergency room and presented, in fact, with Ebola. And the most interesting thing about this is what they did next. And that's where Dr. Weinstein, that's where Gary comes in. Because he was the guy who did everything that it had to be done in order to have an Ebola patient in a hospital in downtown Dallas. And to hear him tell the story, well, that's worth your time. And that's what this podcast was. In fact, the way the meeting people set it up, is that Gary started with the story and then I followed him and talked about sort of the tenets of high reliability and safety differently. And it was perfect because what he did was give the most compelling case study in the whole world, which then allowed us to talk about the adaptive and emergent nature of risk and controls. And so as a benefit, I asked Gary, hey, would you mind very much if I put this on the podcast and he said, absolutely not. I'd be glad to have that on the podcast. And I said, I said, I will. So I set my little recorder up on the podium. And what you're about to hear is Dr. Gary Weinstein. He's going to talk to you about what it was like to see the first Ebola patient in the United States in a hospital in Dallas, Texas. So sit back. Thanks for listening. I'm so glad to have you on board. Get ready because you're going to be kind of riveted to your seat for about the next 30 minutes. Here is that case study. So th- there's there's always a story. And and it was interesting. Two days ago, I sat and listened uh, to the team from Santa Fe talk about what they went through. And the uh, tactical officer talked about 
complacency and how despite all his training, uh, he was complacent when he first got that call. Well, it really struck a chord because every most morning, uh, my wife, who's an internist, she's here, uh, uh, lays in bed, wakes up, looks at her phone and figures out what's going on in the world. I think about, you know, do I have to feed the dogs? What time do I have to go to work? You know, do I have a meeting today? She's thinking about what's going on in the world. And so for months before Ebola came to Dallas, uh, I'd get an elbow in the side and an email about a story. What are you going to do about Ebola? Ebola's coming to Dallas. What are you going to do? Are you guys ready? Ebola's not coming to Dallas. <clears throat> Ignore it for a couple of weeks. I get another email. What are you going to do? It's going crazy. The numbers are going up. It's an epidemic. It's coming to Dallas. Um, we've got a hub for American. What are you going to do? Are you ready? Is Ebola's not coming to Dallas. Uh, yes, dear. Um, and finally, I couldn't take it anymore. And I forwarded one of the emails to our chief of epidemiology and said, do we have a plan? What are we doing about Ebola? And, uh, uh, and his response was, we're working on it. And then a week later, the CDC came out with their recommendations that they sent out as, a, as an email and put on their website for community hospitals about what to do, how to prepare, how to interact with the patient with Ebola. He sent that back to me and said, we got a plan. We're going to follow the CDC's recs. And I think like every other hospital in the United States, except maybe the CDC, but maybe, maybe at Emory in Atlanta. So um, I said, see, we have a plan. Quit bugging me. Um, week before Ebola, my birthday, uh, we get engaged. There's a, there's a slightly younger Alan and his beautiful bride. Uh, and, and then some dude named Eric Duncan gets on a plane in Monrovia, flies to Brussels, changes planes, flies to Dulles, changes planes, lands in Dallas. And unbeknownst to those of us who live a mile and a half away, there is a wonderful little community um, a mile and a half from our hospital that is full of West Africans. And many of them work at our hospital. So Presbyterian was his local hospital. When he got sick, it was, it was the neighborhood hospital. And he showed up in our ER. And, you know, we, we got a second chance at him. And, and the second time, uh, it was a little more clear what was going on. Uh, and that's how the story started. Things got crazy, as Alan uh, alluded to. There were, you know, typically six helicopters flying continuously. All the satellite trucks had their, had their antennas, their satellites up, uh, took out our AT&T. Uh, we didn't have enough bandwidth. AT&T had to bring a, a mobile tower, cell tower, to our campus just so we could use our phones. Uh, it was crazy. Guys were sneaking in the hospital. Uh, the, the craziest one I got was, uh, I think for a second, some reporter uh, had figured out who my son was on Facebook, seen who his girlfriend was on Facebook, went to her Facebook page, saw where she worked, and went up to her. She was a receptionist at, a, at an aerobic studio and gave her her card and said, Will you please give this to your boyfriend to give to his father? I'd love to talk to him. I got phone calls from on my home phone from CNN, uh, all all the agencies. It was crazy. So so here's what we did inside the walls. Uh, an Ebola task force was formed, which sounds really really official and important. It meant that uh, people who were heads of departments who couldn't say no said, "You're on the Ebola task force," uh, uh, and that included me. And and so that meant we were going to have a bunch of meetings and talk about how to handle this. Uh, and the next morning, on the 1st, at 7 in the morning, uh, about 14 people from the CDC were sitting around a table in our big conference room, uh, along with all the leaders at the hospital. And uh, they went around the table and said who they were and what their role was. No cards were given, no instruction sheet that we could refer to later. Um, and they walked around our hospital went to our ICU and we converted our 24-bed ICU into a three-bed uh, 
Ebola isolation ward. Uh, and um, we were just happy because the cavalry was here. We thought, you know, we don't have any idea how to handle this. CDC is all over this. They know how to, they know what they're doing. They're going to tell us exactly what to do. They walk through our ICU, thumbs up, this looks like a perfect protocol. You've got the flow, you've got the one way, you've got the hot, warm, cold zones. Perfect. That was at about eight in the morning, maybe nine in the morning. And, and again, as Alan said, um, in the CDC, anybody who's ever worked with them will know this. There's ER docs, there's epidemiologists, there's ID docs, there's people from all different walks of life, and they all have an opinion about how to comply appropriately with their written protocol. And every time a different person would walk through the ICU, they'd go, it's good except you need to change this. Well, when my staff heard it's good except, that meant what you were doing five minutes ago was wrong and we must be at risk. So my, my nurses, my respiratory therapists, uh, the people up in the ICU interacting either directly or indirectly with Mr. Duncan uh, were going crazy emotionally. It was really hard. Uh, on that same day at four in the afternoon, we had our first of daily phone conferences. It was the local, a couple of the local CDC guys, the docs involved, our CMO, and then on the phone were docs from Emory and docs from Nebraska. And, and they were there because they had seen patients. And they didn't even tell us on the first day, interestingly, because initially Mr. Duncan was on nasal cannula and he wasn't that ill. Uh, it, it was about three, the third day in that they told us, oh, by the way, at Emory, you can't tell anybody, but we have a patient on a ventilator on dialysis with Ebola. Good to know. Um, so uh, we had to think about immediate issues. You know? How do we take care of the patient? What's his medical needs? What are the risks for all of us? And how do we, how do we mitigate them? The physical needs for us and the patient, the psychological needs. Uh, the patient was scared as hell. Uh, he was totally isolated. His family that, that he came to, to, to live with couldn't see him. Uh, we, we, could, we didn't let him get anywhere close. You know, we, we, we did a lot of things that, that we could have done differently in retrospect that seemed reasonable at the time. Uh, or there were decisions that were outside of, of many of our control. Um, but he, he was scared as hell. The nurses, he sat at his bedside and talked to him. Um, he was in a strange place, surrounded by strangers, got a disease that everybody in his country dies from. Uh, and he had no support. Uh, our staff, there's this stranger from Africa who brought this terrible disease and now I'm at risk. They're scared as hell. Their family doesn't want him home. All they want to do is go home at the end of the shift and get a hug. Family doesn't want him anywhere near him. Because uh, they're afraid. So where, where do we get the information and who's in charge? Uh, it, it became clear that who we thought was in charge for the first half of our uh, interaction, which we thought was the CDC, and they've done this before. They've got the, they can just roll out their playbook. They've done this. They, they have all the information. Um, they're not in charge. They're there in a supervisory, advisory role only. And you make decisions, and what decisions you make are your responsibility and yours alone. They will, they own nothing. And that's just the way they work. They're happy to come. They're happy to advise and give you advice. They don't take ownership of anything. So a lot of teams, uh, uh, which was part of the problem, uh, obviously, they had all the stuff that dealing with the patients, the medical team, respiratory nursing, pharmacy played a big role. Obviously, they didn't have direct interaction with the patient. They played a huge role in getting trying to get us meds and find out you know what was available, where, how do we get it. Uh, the administration had a huge role. Security was a big issue. 
on the campus, uh, not just to secure the perimeter of the campus, but to secure the ICU uh, because things got really crazy. Uh, PR was a nightmare. The press wanted a million statements from everybody. I got called once a day from the PR person, who's, who's a, a good friend. And I, my, my job, he said, I need one word of what's the condition on, on each of our three patients that we ended up having. One word. What do you mean one word? I, one, one word. Good, fair, poor, dead. I need one word. And I, I don't think he made that up. I think his higher-ups, that's what they wanted. And then we had the county, because we had the county health department who we had to deal with. We had the state health department who wanted to shut our hospital down and close the doors uh, from, not necessarily from the get-go, but certainly when we got our second patient, they just wanted to close the doors. Um, we had the feds to deal with. Uh, and this is all these silos. Nobody communicated. We had, we had, there were three incident command centers on a, on a daily basis. We had an incident command center, and we had formal meetings twice a day. Beginning of the day, end of the day. The county had uh, an incident command center that, it, that the state was involved with, and the CDC had an incident command center. All on our campus. Nobody talked to anybody. Um, so you'd get, you'd get three phone calls asking the same question from two different people, three different silos. Um, where do we get the info? When it became clear that the CDC was not necessarily, they were very helpful, I don't want to be ungrateful, but, or, or be audited again. But, um, <laughs> but uh, when it became clear that they were not necessarily the absolute correct source of information, where do we get our information? Uh, I reached out to colleagues uh, uh, that I knew who'd been involved in similar experiences. So at the end of the day, uh, it's it's take care of the patient, which which we all knew how to do. You know, ABCs. It's not hard. Uh, and search the internet. Uh, not not a very reliable source of information. The CDC. Big picture helpful. Details, it, it literally changed three or four times each day. And, and, and I, I finally had to go to the, for about four days of that, that it was making my staff want to not come to work. Uh, I had to go to the head guy and say, I, I do not want a single person from your team talking to anybody but me. Because every time the nurses heard that you need to change what you're doing, and it was minor crap. It was very, you know, detailed, minor adjustments. But every single time they heard they needed to change something, that meant what they were doing before was wrong. And that did they get exposed? That they're going to take something home to their family. Uh, and and then and then prior caregivers was was very helpful. You know, when we finally learned that that there's a team at Emory that had a patient on a ventilator on dialysis, uh, you know, a sick, unstable patient. That's really helpful. We want to talk to you, and I don't want to talk to anybody else. Uh, and that—that that was Dr. Crozier, the guy who ended up having the recurrence in his eye uh, you know, many months later. So I, I think I already said this. <laughs> um, there, there are resources out there, you know, that I that I realize now. Like we needed equipment when when we who had pappers. Who, who had hoods and pappers, the respiratory, contained respiratory uh, uh, devices? We had, we had a handful, and, and we're part of a big system. We're a 17-hospital system, uh, and so we could rouse up some pappers. But the moment this hit the news, the run on every piece of equipment related to taking care of an Ebola patient was unbelievable. Uh, so you couldn't, we couldn't order Pappers. We couldn't get them. Didn't matter how much money we had. They were not available. So what do you do? Well, now I know from things I've done after this, uh, you know, there, in Texas we have the, the rack, uh, and they have tons of equipment. 
that, you know, there's lots of resources if you reach out. So your state trauma systems uh, uh, and, and maybe the military. There's, there's people who have stuff that you can get if you need it in an emergency, if you can find the right person to call. Um, even if you're leading in the, in the slightly wrong direction, in, in a situation like this, as, as I'm sure you guys all know, it, there's got to be a leader. There's somebody or a small group of people have got to be in charge because without that, the team totally flounders. Uh, and, and so you, you have to admit what you, what you know and what you don't know and, and say that, you know, and you got to be able to do things that, that, that you want them to do. You can't, you know, in this situation, you can't sit in the background and say, I need you to go in the room and do this. Uh, you got to go in the room and do this and help them. Uh, and, and we spent a lot of time talking uh, on a daily basis to the team members. Uh, just talk about what are you feeling, what are you afraid of, how are you doing, what do you need. Um, we did a ton afterwards. I think the hospital did a, a pretty good job of uh, debriefing and taking care of everybody emotionally afterwards uh, and making this available. Um, now, let's me to talk about failure a little bit or think about failure. Um, which is which is at the time uh, the the first time that I got smacked in the face with that was the very first phone call uh, the, from the CDC, where some voiceless, nameless person on the other end of the phone said, "What are you going to do if he codes?" First of all, he's not going to code. He's on nasal cannula oxygen. He looks fine. Everybody's like, "You're all excited about." It. I go, "Well, what are you going to do if he codes?" And I said, "Well." Because, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years. People make all kinds of decisions that I disagree with. If they, you know, the 90-year-old with widely metastatic cancer wants to be a full code. I, I don't get to decide that for that person. So when that person says, I want to be resuscitated, we resuscitate. Um, you know, you try and explain it and you try and talk sense. But, but at the end of the day, if that's what they want, Patient autonomy has been pounded into our heads since we were medical students. So I said, well, if he codes, I guess we'll code him. And, it, and it, to me, it was like a, a moment from, uh, from South Park. Uh, I just had this vision of, of Stan going, oh, I wouldn't do that. Because that's what the guy said. He goes, oh, I wouldn't do that. Go, what do you mean? I looked at my CMO, and I thought, I am not going to go stand on the steps of the hospital in front of the international community and said, you know, the guy needed to be innovated, and I had all the tools, and I was ready to do it, but we, we decided it wasn't the right thing to do. I'm not doing that. You decide what we're going to do. So, <clears throat> so we thought about death from the get-go. What we, what we were really concerned about was an epidemic. Here's this guy who'd been living in an apartment, a one-room, one-bedroom, not one-room, one-bedroom apartment with his fiance, a bunch of kids, who had left our ER the first time and gone to a job fair, um, you know, while vomiting, having diarrhea, he had wet Ebola, wet symptoms, and we were really worried that there was going to be a whole lot of patients, and how, what were we going to do? You know how many beds there are in this country that are deeply isolated, like, like they have at Emory and at Nebraska? Any guess? How many fingers? Seven. 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 And it, so we were really concerned about an epidemic. What, what is going to happen? What are we going to do? What's going to happen to our community? What's going to happen? How are we going to deal with it? And we talked about that a lot. We had rumors that one of the people in the apartment was pregnant. So we, we, had, we started a plan of what we're going to do if, if this person comes in and has to deliver who may have Ebola. Um, that's what we were worried about. Um, the things that we knew were likely to, to fail or crack mostly was, was the staff. The staff was the, the limiting factor. It took a, a lot of people to care for one person given... <laughs> The time you can spend in the you know in isolation and in and out, and uh, 
it took twice our normal staff to take care of one patient. Uh, so staff was our limiting factor. And at the beginning, we had a lot of really enthusiastic people who, who said, you know, this is what we do. I'm in. And that number began to tail off as the psychological pressure uh, built. Um, and, and we were worried about equipment because that was, that was real. Uh, we had stuff that we didn't have that we needed. Um, things that, that were not on the radar for me, uh, agendas, I guess I, I, sh I should know better. But uh, everybody's got an agenda, uh, and frequently it's hidden. Uh, communication was a huge deal, which I've already mentioned, uh, that we did not solve. Our loss of, of, of comms was, you know, real. We, we had to, until we had the uh, power up, that was a real deal. And this, this was, this I'm sure is obvious, uh, but I just put this on a slide. Kind of a, a usual day in the ICU, no matter how crazy it is, Multiple patients, got a whole team of folks taking care of a bunch of sick people. I can pop into a room, in and out of a room, even somebody in isolation, put on a paper gown and a mask and gloves in you know, 20 seconds and go in and put my finger on their pulse and look at them and listen to them, pop out, in and out, super easy. Uh, lots of resources. Every test known to man. I can order ETKTN. Any test I want that I think I need, I can order and do. Uh, that's a usual day. An Ebola day, one patient, tiny team, 20 minutes. Guys arrested, 20 minutes. I'm not going in without full stuff on, even if my plan is to resuscitate him. I have to do his own CPR until I get there. Um, very austere environment. There was a very limited number of labs that we could do. Things in a closed system, absolutely no cultures of any kind could be sent. Things that we could do on an ISTAT uh, or a, a Piccolo, some of the, the contained cartridge-based uh, labs we could do, not much else. Uh, international attention, that, that was a bit of a sphincter tightener. Um, difficult to communicate. I mean, we, we did a drill a couple weeks ago, uh, and I intubated the patient uh, you know, in, in the drill, and I, and I said, I need a stethoscope. I'm like, oh, wait. You can't, you can't use a stethoscope. You, you got a paper on. You got a hood on. There's no stethoscope. Um, so throw it away. You don't need it. So what to, what to do when the shit hits the fan? Uh, <laughs> Step back and say, why, why is this case different? You know, what, the, the, the most important thing is to figure out why is it the same as every other case you've had, you know, ICU case, because then it's going to give you that sense of calm. And hang on, airway, breathing, circulation, I know how to do that stuff. Uh, communication, uh, if we could do one thing that would have changed, made it a lot easier, uh, fix the communication problem. Uh, don't let today's needs or issues become tomorrow's. Identify them, fix them. Get them off the table because tomorrow there will be 10 more. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help. Look for outside experts. Um, and, and again, if this had happened at a standalone hospital, they'd have shut down. I mean, this cost us $20 million and we didn't have as good a year, but we're part of a huge system and, and it was a blip. Uh, we had the ability to, to get equipment staff from other hospitals, like the huge administration staff came uh, from other organizations, uh, other hospitals within our organization, uh, and that was really helpful. Um, this, this is Alan's slide, which is why it looks organized and thoughtful, and there's no, inappro <laughs> <laughs> there's no inappropriate words on there. Um, but but it, it, it kind of highlights the two different work environments. You know, a normal, stable work environment, things are very predictable, uh, efficiency-based, very very planned out, linear workflow, um, not a lot of, of, even when you're having a bad day, there's not a lot of uh, unstable things going on. Um, you got 
time to take care of the patient, take care of the issues, and, and you have lots of help. Uh, it's a very robust system. And, and volatile environments are, are just the opposite. Very unpredictable, um, capacity-based, nonlinear things are coming out of all angles. Um, time sensitive. You gotta do something right now, uh, or things blow up. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've never given you a Ebola talk where I didn't show this slide. Uh, our, our governor and our, at the time in the far uh, far left. So, so there obviously there were a lot of challenges. Uh, I think I've talked about all this. So I think one of the ones that that I wanted to point out is that evaluating sick patients in the ER. Anybody who works in the ER knows this. Evaluating sick patients in the ER or in a primary care doc's office who might have uh, Ebola is way different than getting a phone call from Congo saying, hey, and I got this patient I'm going to transfer to you to Emory, and they have Ebola. And those guys seemed all calm and everybody thought they know what they're doing. They come with a diagnosed patient. They're totally prepared. They have time to prepare. They say, don't come today, come tomorrow at 3 p.m. Um, and that's a way different animal to deal with than seeing you know, thousands of patients come through your ER, uh, all of which are ill or think they are, who might have some horrible uh, disease that, that is uh, highly contagious. <laughs> Um, and some of this I just thought was interesting. So we had three patients with Ebola. We had seven patients who had believable stories uh, who, who, who got evaluated in the ER. They were all observed for somewhere between 24 and 72 hours. And there were about 30 patients all during that acute phase who uh, people, somebody else was worried about and when you got the real story, the ER doc said, eh. And this, this is what we consume. And I couldn't get to what we actually consume, but this is what was purchased to take care of three patients and these other possible patients and the seven possible patients. <clears throat> it's pretty, uh, I, that, that, those numbers to me were interesting. And, and much of that we had a hard time getting. The gloves were easy, but the, the, uh, the full suits, hood and the thumb uh, deal and the pappers, um, the hoods, all this stuff was very difficult to obtain at the time. Um, we still have this stuff. If anybody wants to buy some very <laughs> inexpensive uh, things, we got a portable x-ray machine that uh, will be used for nothing else but these patients or uh, highly, patients with highly, potentially highly communicable diseases, MERS, uh, uh, Ebola. Uh, we used iStats. Uh, and and they, so they Wi-Fi the info right into the chart. Uh, we have uh, we used one of our older ultrasound machines and did fast exam when he was crashing. We use it for our vascular access. We got a CBVH VHD uh, machine for our RTs. We've got all that in the closet, uh, and uh, we will use it again if we need to. We got a ventilator. None of this stuff we put back out into general circulation. And the reason is the manufacturers um, couldn't decline to tell us how we would need to go about uh, certifying that they were sterile and, and usable on, on the community. So we just didn't. Uh, we had an instant command center, 24 hours a day for 16 days. You can read that. 2,700 calls uh, directed to the instant command center. Realized pretty early we had to create a resolution hotline because there were a lot of people calling who had concerns, who needed answers, and need a little further information. So we set up a, a hotline for somebody to call them back. We, we did learn a lot of stuff from the calls. We, we, people called in with cures. My favorite was that if you cut an onion, and this is, I want to teach you guys this, you cut an onion in half and you duct tape it to the bottom of the feet of the sick person, that will uh, somehow cleanse them of their illness. Um, we, we did have, uh, there's our, there's our portable uh, tower over here. 
or at t so we could have cell service. Um, one Sunday morning at 6 in the morning, somebody tweeted the direct line to the ICU, and, and they had to change the number. I mean, we could not use the phone. You could not pick up the phone. It rang for an hour before we figured out what the hell was going on. You could not use it to call out. No one could call in. So our phone system was dead for an hour, and, and then uh, the IT people changed the number. Uh, we did get death threats to the patient. We got death threats to our staff. Um, but, uh, we were all doing things wrong. So that was the case study I followed. What do you think? Thank you, Dr. Weinstein. It was really, really interesting, and it was so fun to watch you tell the story because I think it's a good story because everything you guys did, even though there were millions of mistakes and millions of errors and much drift and much, much, much motion, you were successful. And you were successful because you adapted in real time and you talked to us. You told us the story of that adaption, which is what that last little – story was. That's remarkable. And that's worth listening to. And that's why we do the podcast. So as usual, I say thank you for listening. Subscribe. If you get a chance to tell your friends, that makes a huge difference. It's always good to have you listen to the pod. It's even better when you're on it. Come on, be on one. Come on, come on, volunteer. You can do it. Until then, learn something new every single day. Bet you did today. Pretty good day for it. Have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, be safe. (laughs) 